Well, hello friends, and thank you for joining me in this study. Now, we have been studying about the 12 apostles and also the, the other two later appointed apostles, Matthias and Paul. And, and I thank you for your patience. I would like to add yet a supplemental lesson to those lessons on uh, the apostles. You know, one thing that the apostles learned was faith. And they learned not only what it was, but how to grow in it. And sometimes the faith was strong, but we know many times Jesus would say, oh, ye of little faith. And so it's something they had to develop. So what I'd like to do is to take a look at the concept, take a look at the idea of faith, and then look at faith, uh, a, a positive example, and then a negative example of how that faith played out. Now, most of us learn through a combination of what we hear and what we see. Uh, that, that's called auditory and visual learners. That, that's just the way most of us learn. We hear something and then we like to see an example. It's just commonly used in the educational process. Uh, Paul used it several times in his teachings. In Galatians 5, he teaches about not returning to the slavery of the old law and against impure living. And then he goes on to illustrate the point by showing the difference between works of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit. So he tells us about it, and then he gives us examples. And it's interesting to note, uh, not only does he do it that way, but he adds to that uh, these fruit of the Spirit, he says, against which there is no law. In other words, you can grow in these fruits, but you need to remove the impure living, the, the uh, sins of the flesh, the works of the flesh, replace it with fruit of the Spirit. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I understand that you know this, uh, a lot of this. It's, it's not going to be something new to you. If it is, wonderful. Welcome to the world of learning. But it's good to be reminded of things. That, that, that helps restore it and encourage us and, and build us up, help us to know we're on the right track with things. Uh, I, one of my favorite uh, passages from... Uh, Peter's writings in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 12 and 13. Uh, Peter is teaching the Christians that, that different things about what they need to be and who they need to be as, as disciples of our Lord, which Peter loved to do. But he, he says he's continuing to remind them. Even though he knows that they know these things and are doing these things, he, he states that he, he continues to remind them. Uh, the English Standard Version actually uses the expression to stir you up by way of reminder. In other words, to encourage them by reminding them. So it's good to be able to go back and look at these things. Uh, you're probably like me also in another way in that as you grow, as you become older physically, as you become more mature, but also as you become more mature spiritually, you begin to see that my life is changing. God's Word does not change, but how it applies to my life changing or changes. So it's good to go back into God's Word and continue to study God's Word and apply it to our current life situation. As our life changes, we have questions. We have concerns. We want to know, am I on the right track? Or what is the right track? Or how do I deal with this situation? God's Word tells us that. So it's good to go back in there. And as we do that, and as we see God's Word working in our lives, we also grow in our faith. Our faith is strengthened. Well, again, I, I want to offer a, a, a three-part illustration or explanation about faith to, to help us understand what faith is. And, and I'll be using, uh, to an extent there, uh, the apostles collectively to show us uh, how that applied. But I also want to take a look at how Peter shows us a positive example of faith in how faith was gained, but then how his faith weakened, but how his faith was regained. Peter's a great example of that. But I also want us to look at Judas Iscariot, understanding that that's not a good example. Uh, I mentioned in a previous lesson, <clears throat> but I'll say it again, it, there's a thing called a non-example, and that's what Judas is. Judas is a non-example of faith because Judas's faith was misdirected and eventually lost. And, and, and so we'll, we'll talk about these two individuals as an example and a non-example. But then I want to end it by asking the question, choose this day, putting our faith in 
into action. And you probably know where I'm going with that. Well, let's take a look uh, at an explanation of what faith is. Well, you know, obviously one of the greatest passages in Scripture regarding faith is uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews. But in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, that's a very positive statement. It, it means faith is not just some nebulous concept out there. Faith is real, and it, and it gives us assurance of the things we hope for. By the way, that term hope is not a nebulous term, like I hope it rains or I hope it doesn't rain or I hope I do this or don't do that or this happens or that happens. It's kind of a nebulous expression of hope, nothing wrong with it, but that's not a hope that we die for. The hope we die for is the assurance, the conviction of the things that our Lord tells us. And we may not fully understand it now, but we will understand it. And so by way of giving us knowledge and then showing us examples, the writer of Hebrews gives us this long list of heroes of the faith. So it's uh, certainly one of the best known verses of Scripture in faith. It's a powerful verse. It introduces this group of historical figures, the people that demonstrated faith. But what I'd like to do, though, is kind of turn our attention away from that list of heroes of the faith and to the apostles as heroes of faith. So let me use now a three-part illustration of what faith is. Faith is knowing God, trusting God, and obeying God. And so think about the apostles. Uh, perhaps you have a specific apostle in mind, and, and you can look at, well, how did that apostle come to know God? How did that apostle learn to trust God? How did that apostle learn then to obey God? And, and sometimes there's a level of knowledge about God, but as that knowledge increases, we're going to see what happens then. By the way, I want to give credit for this. This is based on a concept that's introduced by a fellow named Bill Rasko, a brother in the Lord. He uh, published a book entitled Heroes of the Faith, a study of Hebrews, chapter 11. It's published by 20, uh, 21st Century Christian in 2012. And, and I took Bill's words and, and uh, have applied them to some of my lessons, but I want to give honor to Bill in, in this uh, uh, illustration. Well, again, the apostles provide us with an illustration of faith, knowing God, trusting God, and obeying God. By the way, something ought to come to mind about Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of God. So we gain knowledge about God, God's will for us, and how to put that will into action. We learn that. We gain that knowledge as we read God's Word coming to us through the teachings of Christ through how Jesus taught us what to do and how to do it. Uh, the apostles heard the word of Christ. They began to go beyond the basic knowledge that they might have had to eventually internalizing it and making them more and more like Christ. The definition of spiritual maturity is becoming Christ-like. The more Christ-like we are, the more spiritually mature we are. The more spiritually mature we are, the more Christ-like we are. They work together. So obviously, uh, the apostles uh, had a level of knowledge of God that from their upbringing. They would have participated in uh, synagogue activities, temple worship, as well as synagogue activities. They would have learned about God. That was just part of their education process as Jews. And we see in some cases, uh, Philip, Nathaniel, uh, some of the others, they, they had knowledge and, and, and expressed that they had knowledge, but their knowledge grew as Jesus taught them. Their knowledge grew. Uh, uh, they allowed God to change them. <clears throat> they had knowledge, but sometimes it was obviously misunderstood or misapplied. You know, students learn what teachers teach them. A lot of times, some people, that's all they know is what they have been taught. They've not gone beyond that and discovered for themselves. You know, just as an example, uh, the Sermon on the Mount Jesus stated several times, you have heard it said, but I say. Jesus said, you have heard it said and would fill that in with a common teaching. And then he would say, but I say. And then he would teach further knowledge about how God really wants us to know something. Even at the resurrection of Jesus, the apostles, uh, uh, even up to the time of his ascension, the apostles had misunderstandings. Uh, 
they didn't have the complete knowledge that they would later gain. They had knowledge and it was growing, but it had so much more to go. And, and, and really and truly, that's the same way with us. Uh, becoming who God wants us to be, like Jesus, is a lifetime of studying and living what we learn from Jesus Christ. And it's a wonderful journey. It's a journey that we started on as we became seekers. We started on when we became citizens of God's kingdom. And it should grow as a driving force in our lives as we learn more and more. Well, the second element of uh, faith, the first was knowing God. The second is trusting God. Trust is often used as a synonym for faith, uh, but it's actually a part of faith, as we're going to see here. A key point about trust and its relationship to knowledge is that we generally, we, we generally don't trust or have a deep trust in something that we don't have a lot of knowledge of. That trust has to grow. Now, we, we might be willing to go along with something because somebody told us that's what we need to do and we accept it, but accepting is different than trusting. The more we know something, the more likely we are to trust. We might obey or go along because that person has authority or power or, well, I've got nothing else to do. But generally, we don't have that willingness until later. Uh, the the uh, apostles learn more about Jesus. They began to grow in their trust. It, it's a very positive cycle. The more we know, the more we trust. The more we trust, the more we want to know. So it's a very positive cycle. And I've already mentioned it, but it brings me to that third element, and that is of obeying God. Uh, this third element of faith is critical. Just like knowing and trusting, obeying is critical. We know that. Uh, just as our trust grows with more knowledge, our desire to obey grows greater with more knowledge and trust. Uh, Jesus teaches us that uh, faith must be accompanied by action. In, in Matthew chapter 7, verses uh, 27 and following, he teaches us that if we don't put his words into effect, we're foolish. And he gives an example of a man who builds a house on sand, uh, indicating not uh, putting God's words into effect. And when storms came, washed it away. We know that if we don't have faith, storms of life are going to come on us and, and we will be weakened and potentially destroyed. But then Jesus goes on and he talks about how um, a wise man builds his house on rock. In other words, we build our house on the faith of our Lord, doing what our Lord says. And then when those storms of life hit us, we stand strong, not on our power, but God stands there in our place. So Matthew 7, 24 through 27 is, is one teaching, but not just the teachings of Jesus, but James teaches us in chapter uh, 2 of James, uh, faith has no value unless it leads to action. Faith without works is dead. We, we know that expression. So we see there that obeying God is just a critical a part, a, a critical part of, of faith, knowing God, trusting God, and obeying God. Well, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, the apostles became excellent examples of faith. They grew in knowledge of our Lord. They learned from God's will. They learned to trust our Lord because of that increased knowledge. And then they not only were willing to obey, but sought to obey. And they fulfilled their mission of carrying the gospel to the world. That's what happens with us. We grow in knowledge of our Lord. We learn to trust our Lord. We turn our lives over to Him. Thy will, not my will. And we learn then the importance of obeying and the desire to obey. And we put that faith into action. And we fulfill our mission of teaching the gospel to everyone, of showing Jesus to everyone. We also fulfill our gospel of encouraging, or fulfill our mission of encouraging each other. We fulfill our mission of of of, of showing Jesus to a lost and starving world and keeping each other faithful. By the way, you can look in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, and see how that happened. The early Christians remained in Jerusalem. They learned at the feet of the apostles what the teachings of Jesus were. They had fellowship with one another. That's that encouraging element. And they found favorable, favorableness with the people in the area surrounding them, and many souls were brought to Christ.
knowing God, trusting God, and obeying God. Well, I want to change now. That's the lesson part of it. Now, now I want to show some examples. Uh, we're going to look at faith gained, faith weakened, and faith regained. And of course, I'm going to be talking about Peter. Peter's just an incredible example. Let's talk about faith gained. In uh, John chapter 1, we begin to uh, read about Peter's walk of faith. Uh, when he was called to serve Jesus, we read in uh, John 1, 41, starting there, Andrew uh, had Jesus pointed out to him by John the Baptist. And uh, uh, Andrew spent the afternoon with Jesus, uh, learning uh, who Jesus was and some of the teachings. What an incredible afternoon that would have been. And uh, he, he was so... Uh, uh, caught up and, 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 and so excited about it, he goes to Peter and says, we found the Messiah and, and uh, encourages Peter then to come with him. Brought Peter to the gospel. You know, I, I uh, one time used uh, the uh, illustration of dropping a pebble into a pond during a sermon I was giving. It was actually, by the way, uh, a, a funeral sermon I was preaching at or speaking at uh, the man who brought me to the gospel. And, and I use the example of dropping a pebble in the pond and how the ripples go out and we don't know the extent of how far it's going to go. Those that'll be impacted. Peter was brought to the Lord by Andrew. Andrew dropped the pebble in the pond and now Peter took it, ran with it as the others did as well. That's a whole new lesson and I, I sorry to deviate there a little bit, so let's move on. But we read about Peter, that faith gain. We don't know the specific moment it doesn't indicate that when Peter got that aha moment, but it was there. Later, he would declare his willingness to die for the Lord. Uh, Matthew 26, 33 through 35, and in Luke 2, 31 and 32. I'm going to come back, especially to Luke uh, chapter 2 as we go through this. Peter, drew, Peter grew in knowledge of our Lord. He learned to trust our Lord and he learned to obey our Lord. But it was a journey for Peter. And there were obstacles in the way that he had to overcome in that journey, but he kept at it. And eventually he became what our Lord wanted of him. He became that giant of the faith. And you know, there's just many examples uh, in the gospels. And, and even later as, as uh, Paul would write about Peter as well, um, that, that Peter demonstrated incredible faith and, and, and his walk of faith. Uh, one of the favorite of so many people, of course, is Peter walking on the water, found in Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Um, Peter's walking on the water to go to Jesus during a storm. But by way of illustration about this lesson of faith gain, faith weaken, and faith regain, Peter in faith stepped out of the, the boat to go toward Jesus. He's walking on the water. And he looks around and he sees himself in this water. His faith weakened and he began to sink. He, the great sermon, he took his eyes off of Jesus. And, but faith was regained. He called out to Jesus. Jesus reached down, pulled him out of the water. They went and got in the boat. Boy, that, that's, that's the entire concept uh, encapsulated in that event. Faith gained, faith weakened, faith regained. Let's talk about faith weakened now. In Luke 22, verse 31 and 34, uh, we see an event where Jesus for, foretold that Peter is going to deny him. Uh, Peter declares that he's going to follow Jesus even to the death. You, you know, eventually in his life he would do that. But in this moment of, of uh, declaring that fealty, declaring that he, I, I'm willing to die for you, Lord. Well, Jesus replies to him that before the rooster crows three times that day, that Peter would deny him. And of course, the narrative continues, and Peter did deny Jesus just as he said he would. But the narrative has something else that Jesus said in his statement, and it's such a valuable thing. It, it provides comfort to Peter later as he perhaps looked back on that and remembered it. Jesus said that he had prayed for Peter that he would not lose his faith. Uh, in, in verse 32, he states that he prayed so that his faith would not fail. Well, Peter's faith did weaken. We know that. But it did not fail completely. Peter did not lose his faith. And that's a, such a key point there. Peter was tested. Remember James chapter 1, verse 2? James talks about how to count it joy when we're tested because that testing 
uh, helps us build endurance or steadfastness. You know, sometimes a test, it, not only does it, it help us in terms of, uh, I'm showing you what I know uh, in regards to how we traditionally think of tests, but a test also teaches. A test reinforces in us. Uh, think back to the times when you have prepared yourself to take a test of some kind in, in, in a school. You spend time studying. In other words, I'm preparing for that test. That, that test uh, then reinforces th through that study process my knowledge. And so Peter was tested. And, and from that uh, ultimate success, uh, Peter learned uh, what faith was and the importance of it, and his faith was strengthened. Initially, it was weakened. Uh, Peter was taught, he was tested, and then he regained his faith. Uh, Peter's faith did weaken, but it did not fail completely. We know that after Peter denied Jesus, he went out and wept bitterly. Uh, he felt remorse, absolutely. He knew what he had done, how he had failed his Lord and Master, uh, Jesus, whom he loved so much. And, and so I suspect as much as in disappointment and shame, uh, he just went out and wept bitterly. That ultimate, uh, just intense remorse for what he did. So there's Peter, a, a, a man uh, who not long before had declared fealty to Jesus in the strongest possible terms. I'll die for you. And not once, but three times, Peter denied him. And yet Peter held on to his faith. Though weakened, though he felt that intense remorse, his faith was not lost. Well, I want to look at how Peter regained his faith. Again, we're looking at Luke 22, starting in verse 31. I've already read Jesus' statement about praying for Peter. He would not lose his faith. I want to go back to the second part of that statement in verse 32. Jesus said, And when you have returned again, strengthen your brothers. When you have returned. Jesus is communicating to Peter, you're going to weaken but you're going to come back. And then he gives him a very personal commission. And when you have returned, strengthen your brothers. In John 20, we read of the resurrection of Jesus and, and how he appeared to various disciples, including the apostles. But upon hearing of the resurrection, Peter and John, they take off running to the tomb. They want to see the Savior. John arrives first. Uh, he stops to look in. Peter pushes past him. That's Peter pushing past him, and he enters the tomb. Later, the disciples are in a room, and the door's locked, and Jesus appears to them. Note uh, that, that um, uh, Peter is not mentioned by name in that particular incident. It's, it just uses the disciples, including Peter. They were all there. It seems, as I read that, I kind of got a sense that Peter was, was still doubting himself. He still was in that weakened state position. Before I go to uh, what happened after that, I, I, I want to point out something in Mark's account. I, I love the way Mark recorded it. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, ladies, the women... Uh, had come to the tomb to prepare the body. Of course, the body was not there. The angel was there, and the angel was told them, go tell the disciples and Peter. Wow. That, that, that was a moment. Don't ever forget uh, our Lord is a forgiving Lord. We just need to turn to Him. So go tell the disciples and Peter. So Jesus was, I think... Uh, the, what the angel was saying there was kind of laying the foundation for Peter to be able to regain his faith. So let's look now at John 21. Uh, we read there of Peter regaining his faith. Peter, along with some of the others, had gone fishing. Uh, this is a remarkable event I'm going to get to in a second. But while there, while they're out there fishing, Jesus is standing on the shore and he tells them, cast their nets on the other side. Have you caught any fish? No. Cast your nets on the other side. When they do, they caught so many, they could hardly pull the nets in. Stop for a moment and think about something else that happened in the life of the apostles, and Peter was a part of it. I love finding connections in scriptures because it shows the validity of scripture and it shows how, how scriptures fit together into a narrative. It's not these isolated events. 
It's all God's story. And the heart of the story, of course, is Jesus. But that event in John 21 that we just talked about, it, it was not lost on Peter. Remember in Luke 5, it records that Jesus told the disciples to cast their nets. Peter stated that they had been working all night without catching any fish. But as Peter did, he did as Jesus stated. They caught so many fish that their nets began to tear. The nets began to break. Well, now back to my point, that was not lost on Peter. And I know that was not lost on Peter because when John recognized it's the, it's the master, Peter, the, the expression in the, in the English Standard Version, it says Peter threw himself into the water. I love that expression. Peter's in his, his uh, undergarments. They're out there, his work clothes. They're out there fishing. He, he, he puts on his outer garments and throws throws himself into the water and swims to shore. He's not waiting on his brothers out there. Y'all keep fishing. I'm going to go see the master was kind of the idea there. So, so, so Peter jumps in the water. He throws himself in the water and he swims to the master. And as the narrative continues, the others then came in and Peter actually got in and helped pull the fish in. But, but there's Peter and, and he's, he's on the shore. And then as the narrative continues... Jesus asks Peter three times if he loved him. Peter answers all three times, yes, you know that I love you. The third time he answered it in distress because that moment was also not lost on Peter. Peter remembered very clearly that he had denied Jesus three times and now Jesus reinstates him three times. What a wonderful action that was. This, this action of asking three times and calling Peter to follow him. Peter told our Lord three times that he, would, that he denied him three times and now that he loves him. But Jesus concludes this event by once again calling Peter to follow him, verse 19. So Peter regained his faith and he did so by focusing on Jesus. Follow, uh, P Peter understood and he accepted this time the idea of following Jesus. Earlier, when Jesus first called Peter and said, follow me, I'm gonna make you fishers of men, Peter followed him, left their nets, followed Jesus. That was the beginning of his journey and he stumbled and fell. Jesus said again, follow me. And this time Peter was fully committed to the Lord, 100% with every bit of his being. Peter was now a disciple of Jesus. So Peter regained his faith. Now fully restored, Peter would do the second part of that statement Jesus said, and when you have returned, encourage your brothers. To this day, Peter encourages us. As Peter is ending 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and forever. So Peter grew and never, <clears throat> Peter never, ever relinquished his faith again. Peter would have times when he would have to grow some more, but he continued to grow. All right, so we've looked at how Peter went through gaining, weakening, and regaining his faith. And although he failed at times, he never lost focus on the Lord. Uh, he, he continued to be the Lord's man. Well, I want to look now at another figure of Scripture whose faith was misdirected and lost. This is that non-example. And of course, I'm, I'm talking about Judas Iscariot. Uh, Judas, faith misdirected and lost. Judas was one of the 12 chosen by Jesus to be an apostle. He's listed among the apostles in every listing except Acts 1.13. Now we know in there his name's mentioned, but not as an apostle, but one whom Matthias would replace. So of particular reference is in John chapter 6, verse 70 and, and uh, 71. Uh, the, a point of note here, recall that this is when many of the disciples had turned away from Jesus uh, because of what he was teaching. It was just too difficult for them to understand and to accept. Jesus stated he had chosen the 12, but that one of them was going to betray him. And then John goes on and specifies that it was Judas. Judas was with Jesus from the beginning. He traveled with him just as the others had. 
Uh, he had been given the same gifts to drive out demons, to heal, to uh, given chances to proclaim the good news of Jesus as the Messiah. That's in Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 and 2 and following. But we see throughout the narrative, Judas was there. He was part of the 12, just like all of them. He had the same raw material. He had the same opportunities to develop faithfulness and to show faithfulness. But his faith was misdirected. You see, his faith was on himself and on some others that could not help him rather than having his faith and his focus on Jesus. Judas never internalized, never made the words of Jesus truly a part of him. The other apostles had weaknesses to overcome. Well, so did Judas. But the other apostles overcame their weaknesses. Judas did not. Uh, others chose to return to Jesus. Judas chose to remain apart. The others fled from Jesus in fear, but they all returned. Judas too could have returned. And friends, uh, as we stated in the lesson on Judas, what a wonderful story that would have been. Uh, that, that was the ultimate missed opportunity. Instead of realizing his sin, his betrayal of Jesus, Judas went to the chief priest to find forgiveness. His faith was misdirected. It was on himself and it was on them. They couldn't offer him hope. So here Judas is without hope couldn't gain forgiveness. And so he tragically took his life, a life wasted. Remember I said when Peter denied Jesus, the intense remorse he felt, he went out and wept bitterly. Judas also experienced remorse. Judas tragically took his life though, it was a life wasted. Peter's words, or Jesus' words to Peter, and when you have returned, Judas didn't return. And again, I say, what an incredible story that would have been. Judas could have said, I'm the man who betrayed Christ. I returned to Christ and Christ forgave me. He can forgive you. Well, he forgave Peter. He can forgive us. He would have forgiven Judas, no doubt in my mind. The impact of telling others about the forgiveness of Jesus, if Judas could have done that, what a wonderful encouragement that would be. But Judas missed that opportunity. His faith was misdirected and he lost his faith. Because he lost his faith, he lost hope. Because he lost hope, he lost his life. Well, we don't have to be like that. We must not be like that. We don't know a lot about what went on in the life of Judas, but one thing we know for certain, he chose poorly. Well, I want to look now at the final part of this lesson. Choose this day. Let's put our faith into action. Let's choose to put our faith into action. Choosing is a major gift. And, and, and in some ways, uh, it, I think it's a way in which we're created in the image of God. God gives us the gift of choice. Um, God chose to create us. God chose to save us. He, began that in Genesis 3, starting in verse 15, after Adam and Eve had sinned. He put that uh, plan that he chose to put into action. But we choose to disobey and we choose to reject God in, in some way, maybe not deliberately, uh, maybe out of negligence, who knows, and, and to what degree, but nevertheless, as Paul would say, we sin, all of us do. And so we choose to disobey and reject God but we also choose to submit and to return to God. And we choose to remain faithful. And we, when we submit and return to God, God chooses to forgive us again, set us straight, get us back on that path to who he wants us to be like, and that's like Christ. And so we choose to remain faithful. Choice has consequences, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And so we choose, we must choose wisely as, as Peter and so many others have done. Peter chose wisely to return to the Lord. He, he didn't stop at remorse. He went on into repentance, turning back, refocusing on Jesus. Judas chose poorly. He did not come back to Jesus, did not refocus on Jesus. He turned away from Jesus. When we choose to follow Jesus, we choose wisely. 
and we put faith in action. And when we choose to follow Jesus, we choose wisely to know God, to trust God, and to obey God. We put our faith in action. And when we choose to remain faithful, we're choosing to be prepared for our Lord's return. And, and really, that's, that's a message Jesus gave us in, in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Uh, as His ministry is drawing to a conclusion, we are, we are to be ready. We are to choose wisely. We, we get ready by coming into that relationship with the Lord, and then we choose to remain faithful. Well, let me conclude. Let me conclude by saying faith brings us to God. It keeps us in that relationship as we live as God wishes for us to do. Peter developed faith. He weakened his faith, but it was regained. He went on to serve faithfully, even to the death, as he said he was willing to do. Judas, unfortunately, had misdirected faith, sometimes in himself, sometimes in others, but not, not in our Lord. Uh, the events of Peter's denial and Judas's betrayal occurred in the same time frame. Uh, they both had chosen wise or un, unwisely in the initial part of it and had to deal with the consequences of it. But Peter then chose wisely to return to the Lord. Judas chose poorly by not returning to the Lord. Peter came to know God, trust God, and obey God. Judas removed that opportunity. Well, let me close by again looking at Joshua 24, starting in verses 14 and 15. He tells them to choose this day whom they'll serve. And he says, uh, serve the God in whose uh, land they, their forefathers were, or choose those from around them, or choose to serve Jehovah God. And then he goes on to says, he's going to serve our Lord. Uh, I, I hope you echo the words of Joshua I, I've committed my life to, and, and it's a journey that all of us need to enter onto, and it has up and down times, but we keep focused on Jesus. But Joshua concluded this statement, says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, friends, thank you again for your time, uh, that precious gift. Thank you for that. Thank you for your interest in this study. And remember, in all things, we give God the glory. Thank you very much.